Hi, I'm Steve Van Meter, and welcome to your Wednesday night live that is being pre-recorded, mainly because for those of you following along with my wife's surgery, I am putting on my home health care nurse by night, and well, I can't really do a live when I'm uh, take helping taking care of her, but the good news is she is progressing slowly, which would be expected after such a major surgery, and you know, while pain levels are still high, we're hoping for that one day that you know they just drop, and uh, I think that's coming soon, but she is uh, progressing quite well, and uh, you know, able to almost walk on her own without a walker, which is just staggeringly impressive. And of course, while her daughter Daxon will never probably watch this video, if it wasn't for her, there would be no way uh, her mom would be progressing as quickly as she is. And so, of course, I'm very grateful to her daughter for being there during the day so I can be here uh, at work during the day. Anyways, I want to talk about the market rising on bad economic news. And it's kind of weird. You know, we keep seeing, you know, more data, not just domestically, but globally saying things are pretty weak and yet stock prices are rising. And that often doesn't make a lot of sense to people. But one thing that's happening this week is on Friday, it's what's called quadruple witching day. And it seems kind of weird. It's not that witches are gonna come out on their broomsticks or four of them for that matter, but it's it's an options expiration date. It's one of the biggest options expiration dates uh, in the Wall Street calendar, if you will. And wh what this means is lots of bets are coming due. So how an option contract works is really simply, it's like betting on your favorite sports team. You know, you're just betting that they're going to win and, and maybe they're going to win by a certain margin or so, so many points that you're going to pick. And, and that's kind of what an option is, how it works. And people buy them and said, hey, if, if it reaches this level or higher, I, I, I make money. If it doesn't, I lose money. And so a lot of people took these, uh, speculators took bets using option contracts. Now, the problem is if you don't reach your target, well, you've lost your money. And uh, one way to help you get to your target is to buy the underlying security you bought the option on. And so you kind of forcibly drive the market higher or lower, depending on which way you're betting. In this case, they're betting on it being much higher than it is now. And so when you get closer to this options expiration date and you're short the target, well, you got to dig into your pocket and not buy more option contracts, literally just buy those securities, whether it be the broad market, say the S&P 500, or maybe a share of Amazon. It just depends on where they put their option contracts on. And so what we're seeing right now is, is pretty weak volume from market perspective, but it's like, wow, why is it going higher? As data is saying it, things are getting worse, it's because these people want to cash in on those bets. And so they've gone down on the field to help their team win. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Uh, before we get into uh, the charts and other stuff I want to look at, as you know, uh, we've got to cover our disclosures. Where's my button here? The content of this video is provided as educational information only is not intended to provide investment or other advice. This material is not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by selling security, financial by instrument, or to participate in any particular training strategy. This video was prepared by Stephen Van Meter, own personal capacity, opinion expressed the video that I want to do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advisors Inc. or Stephen Van Meter Financial. So what happens after options expiration date, such as uh, quadruple riching day, well, markets usually go down uh, and there's come other factors, not only do the weakening economic data, uh, the corporate share share buyback blackouts start going in full swing next week. And the, so that's another factor pushing stocks higher is these things are peddled to the metal in terms of corporates buying their stock back. And we already know from earlier this year uh, that they're buying at a rate double what they did last year, even though they don't have twice as much money there's another story to that is first quarter earnings are expected to be much worse than they were initially projected back at the end of the fourth quarter. And of course, who knows the real data? Well, it's the CEOs, corporate executives who have access to the real time data. And what do we know based on their public disclosures? They're massively selling stocks as fast as they can at a super fast pace. So they're, at, they're directing their companies to buy stocks as quickly as they're selling it. Plus next week we have the Fed uh, meeting. Although nothing expected to come out in terms of a rate hike, we are expecting to get some news on when the balance sheet unwind may stop. And that would be probably toward the later end of this year now that uh, based on the Fed backing down, which is uh, pretty cowardly in my opinion on their behalf. But nevertheless, that is what we can expect based on uh, Fed Chairs Powell's most recent speech last week is the Fed's going to back off. Now, for those of you who think that the Fed backing off is bullish, well, and every time the Fed does back off, well, that means they've gone way, way too far and they know it. Well, the economy's slowing down. First quarter projections from the government, from the Fed, 
is the GDP growth would be somewhere under half a percent. Yikes. Certainly doesn't support the bullish narrative for stocks. All right, so I, I did fix that uh, world dollar liquidity chart. I want to take a look at that. So here we have in blue world dollar liquidity, which is federal debt held by foreign and international investors, plus the monetary base. And then all I've done is add the 10 year treasury constant maturity rate. And so the 10 year treasury is over here, world dollar liquidity is over here. And let's just take a quick look at this. I wish there was some way I could deal with that box. But anyways, um, maybe if I just freeze my mouse. Nope, nope. All right, well, whatever. So you can kind of see going into the 80s where there was a disconnect. You see 10-year treasury yields rising, world dollar liquidity falling. Now, why did that happen? It's because interest rates were adjusting to us going off the gold standard. And they kind of start working their adjustments out, but the idea being is world dollar liquidity rises and then you get a response by 10-year treasury yields rising. And, and that makes a lot of sense because when trade increases, it creates dollars. Dollars, by definition, are inflationary. And so interest rates rise to offset an increase in inflation. I mean, it's just how it works. All right, so back to the chart. You'll notice the world dollar liquidity kind of flattens. It's kind of slightly downward trend. We see yields fall, but too much. And then they rise going into a slump in world dollar liquidity because maybe people were got bullish about the economy, shorted interest rates higher. And then all of a sudden interest rates collapse as world dollar liquidity rises. And then it kind of, it's, you see right near starting to fix, adjust themselves. And you see world dollar liquidity falling, interest rates falling, going into recession that no one thought was gonna happen. Interest rates got pushed higher, then collapsed down and continue to collapse even as world dollar liquidity rose uh, coming out of that recession. And then world dollar dollar liquidity falls, interest rates eventually fall, world all dollar liquidity gets shot up. This is the Fed doing quantitative easing and uh, foreign central banks buying treasury. So that drives it up. There's not a big response in treasury yields. But after this point here, notice how well these two are in sync. I'm trying not to get the mouse with it, but you'll see world dollar liquidity rises, interest rates rise. Let's kind of try to say that twice in a row. World dollar liquidity falls, interest rates fall. Now look right in here, you see world dollar liquidity rising, interest rates are rising, but world dollar liquidity is collapsing in the fourth quarter data will show it down much further, as I pointed out, just based on the movement of the monetary base, and everyone thinks yields are going higher. And the answer is, no, they're not. They are going lower. Now, the other thing I wanted to look at, which is something new, not really new, but new because the government's been shut down and we haven't had access to this data. Wouldn't have been nice to, but you know, if they can't publish it, we can't look at it. So we're on the Hedgeopia web, website, uh, that's H-E-D-G-O-P-I-A.com, and we're looking at their commitment to traders, a peek into the future through futures, how hedge funds are positioned. And the gentleman that runs the site updates this every uh, Saturday, which is really cool. And you've seen these, some of these charts before if you've watched these videos in the past, but we can look at 10-year treasuries. We can see the speculators are still short. Now, not as short as they once were, and there's still a lot of shorts in other places, but this is just showing pretty much how hedge funds are positioned. There's still a lot of other people that are short uh, the bond market, and you can see that being short, they have taken some losses here because they thought the market was, or interest rates were gonna go higher. They went lower, they took losses, so they backed off their short positions right here. Looking at the 30 year, uh, we can see there were heavy short and interest rates are down. They you know, got, got in trouble there and had to back off, but are still net short. This is all interesting stuff. Um, we're, oil, uh, you can see here oil, they were long oil and got clobbered as oil went down and still the bullish narrative that the global economy is magically going to inflate is still keenly in the eyes of hedge fund managers. Uh, from the S&P standpoint, you can see they went long at the bottom and then immediately turned around and went short as it kept rising. So they're trying to, they, you can see the speculators, these, these hedge fund managers believe that the market is coming down. Let's see if they are continue to be convicted by that. Uh, here's the NASDAQ. Yep, they're short the NASDAQ. And here's the Russell 2000. They've been short the Russell 2000 through this rebound. So you can see they got really hurt uh, right in there. Uh, let's go back up and look at gold. Would have loved to have this, uh, but all this here is all blacked out. We could not see any of this as it was going on. 
But speculators were net short. They went long. Gold did not break out as they were hoping to. And now we see them backing off their long positions. Um, not a real surprise. I still think there's another pullback in gold because they're premature on their movement there. There just wasn't enough oomph to push gold where it needed to go. Uh, dollar's been rising as hedge funds have been backing off their long. And then from a volatility standpoint, you can see there have been massively short volatility. So they're shorting, you know, this is how they're driving stocks higher is they're shorting, they're short the market, but they're really short volatility. And last times they've been short volatility, volatility spiked and caused a mar major market unwind. And well, you know, there's no doubt we can expect that to happen uh, once again. So let's, uh, we've got what, uh, four and a half minutes. Let's go quickly run through some charts and see what we've got. The S&P 500 today, smack in the middle of resistance, try to just nudge his nose over and got smacked right back down. If we zoom this out, you can see this is not a bullish chart at all. This is very bearish because you see stocks are finding resistance at 2800. I mean, the tries they might, they tried again and bounced off support here and made another run, which looks pretty good. But with quadruple witching day on Friday and corporate share, buy back, <laughs> corporate share buyback blackouts getting really strong next week, the buyer that's pushing this up is going to disappear really quick. And from a volume standpoint, you can see there's just not much trading volume in here. There's not a lot of, not a lot of shares being traded, uh, shares trading hands. So this is not a positive sign when the last marginal buyer of corporate of corporates bows out because they have to. It tells you the market's going to head back down because the insiders have been selling. The, uh, and then that you know brings us back to again fourth quarter earnings are not going to be as good as everybody is hoping they're going to be. Watch for a lot of revisions coming to that announcement, and we've seen stocks get pounded by the computer algorithms for missing. So it should be pretty interesting. Uh, from a bond standpoint. 10-year treasury yields are sitting right on their support level. They actually crossed just back over it today at right before close. They got shorted up there. Again, why do people short treasuries? There's two reasons. One, they believe interest rates are going higher. Number two, if I borrow a security. So let's say I borrow, you know, let's say I borrow your car, right? And let's just pretend I can go buy the identical car to the exact specs, right? I take your car. I say, I'm going to borrow from you for a couple of weeks. And then I go sell it. I take the cash. I go buy some stocks for a while hope to cash in on my stocks, take those profits, go back out to the market, buy your car, which hopefully has gone down in value. So I buy the car back, give it back to you, and I net profit the difference. That's the whole idea of what is going on. So the stock market gets fuel from people shorting the bond market. That is until the bond market breaks down, and then all of those people who are short are forced to go back and buy ahead of time that car in this case, but they have to sell their stocks to get the car and the stocks have not appreciated as much as they needed them to. Very confusing, but nevertheless, we see this thing just teetering on the edge of support. We see this false break up in yields, completely rejected, lots of demand at treasury auctions this week. So this is just sitting on the cusp of breaking completely down. Uh, Five-year yields, the same there on there below here, just looking to start unwinding of this move. And on the 30-year bond, I'm going to guess they closed just over 3% today after closing just below under their 50-day moving average. Again, just sitting right above support around 2.96. And that breakdown there, again, says there's going to be just a monster, monster short squeeze. All right, 90 seconds left. Let's go look at uh, oil and gas producers real quick. This is kind of interesting. A lot of people think... Uh, to this to this week's draw or last week's draw on oil is really bullish but the amount of the draw is pretty small so today we see oil and gas stocks came back up crossed just over their 50-day moving average and ran right into the bottom end of the support level so again support becomes resistance so up so here's support this channel here between these two purple lines so when you break through support it now becomes resistance is trying to fight through question is, well, I'm going to guess not because a decelerating money supply and contracting world all equity is not bullish for oil at all. Uh, let's take a final look at gold and we'll zoom out on the gold chart here. So we can see it came down below its 50 day new moving average. It got into this resistance level because it was support when it came down. Now it's resistance. It cracked through it today. I'm going to guess it's probably not going to hold because we've seen this case before where it's come up, 
got down through the 50 day here, came back up and cracked its nose right over it and looked, ah, ha, ha, here we go. And then boom, came back down. So I'm guessing it still supports my narrative that somewhere around 1240, 1250, is right where this thing's got a destination of. And at the moment, you can say there's a left shoulder, right shoulder forming. Here's, you know, a head. Here's your neckline. And we could measure, say, where are we, 1280. Um, so 80 points from here uh, tells us that we're potentially somewhere down in the 1220s if this becomes a valid pattern. Hard to say, but still, prices ought to come back down one last time based on what we're looking here um, in the charts. All right, so we've uh, just a few seconds over, but we'll be back on Friday for our more comprehensive update. I'm Steve Van Meter. Until then, bye now.